I'm Barbara Raffle Price, Dean of Graduate Studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I'm here today to interview Professor Donald E. J. McNamara, who's Distinguished Professor of Criminal Justice Emeritus at John Jay College. Hi, Mac. Hi. May I call you that, although all your colleagues do, and all, even former students call you Mac. So Some of them call me other things, but go ahead. <laughs> Let me start with that. Mac, let's start out with sort of talking about how you got into this field of criminal justice. I met you in 1970 when you were doing some lectures at John Jay, but I know that it was many decades earlier that you got into criminal justice and criminology. Do you want to start at the beginning for us? Yes, it was rather early, and actually it was rather adventitious or serendipitous that I got into criminology. I graduated from a Jesuit preparatory school in 1933 the middle of the Great Depression, where my four years of Latin and three years of Greek entitled me to the unemployment dole. Mm -hmm. So instead, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and got $17.85 a month and thought I was well off. And being big and a boxer, they made a military policeman out of me, and uh, that started my career in this field. So it was, it actually was, you were put into policing with as much education as many police officers today are required to have, a high school education, right? Well, at that time, uh, uh, big muscles were much more important exactly. than big brain cells. But that's the history of policing. Then what happened? Well, uh, I spent several years uh, doing ordinarily uniform police work in various places uh, in the United States and China and various other places. And then I uh, took advantage of the military in that uh, they're always looking for people to go to school. And at th in those days, and maybe today it's the same thing, there weren't too many uniform people who were interested in going to school. So I always had my hand up whenever anything came. I took a course in advanced criminal investigation, a course as staff intelligence officers, uh, several courses in uh, interrogation and lie detection, etc. And finally, in 1939, I got commissioned and uh, was assigned as a Marine officer to the Office of Naval Intelligence, uh, which enabled me to be a little freer in what I was doing. And I started my uh, uh, collegiate career at that time uh, uh, partly at Drake University, partly at uh, New York University, and then finally at Columbia University. Which is where you got your bachelor's degree? I got my bachelor's degree at Columbia okay. in 1939, but uh, not in criminology. Columbia had no criminologists okay. at that time. My major was political science, and my minor was very imposing clinical psychopathology, well. uh, where I worked under <laughs> Dr. Michael Lonergan up at Manhattan State Hospital and uh, met a large number of persons who were found not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. And those were the first real serious criminals I had to deal with. That was a pretty good foundation, actually, for those days, right? I found so later. It turned out to be very, very well done. When, now, when you finished Columbia, did you then leave the military? Well, unfortunately, when I finished Columbia, World War II had just started. Oh. And while we weren't in, uh, they started to expand the Army, and uh, a large number of us transferred from the Marine Corps into the Army mm -hmm. at the time because promotions seemed to be faster. Mm -hmm. And I, I went over into the Army, into the Corps of Military Police, and stayed uh, in the Corps of Military Police until 1948. You were probably very well prepared then for that job because of your background. Yes, I had uh, quite a, uh, an interesting career in North Africa and mm -hmm. Italy, Greece, and France. Uh, commanded a military prison. I was chief of the vice squad in Naples and other interesting jobs. Mm -hmm. And did quite a bit of work with court martial, uh, mainly as a, a prosecutor. Wow, so that's police, courts, corrections, that's all. It covered the waterfront yeah. largely. Yeah, you were the generalist. The only thing I didn't run into were women criminals because we didn't have uh, very many women in the military at the time. No, Nowadays, uh, I noticed that quite a few of the courts martial have to do with women. Mm -hmm. Well, they're being treated just like soldiers. So let us go beyond the military then. Eventually, you left the military. Yes, in 1948, right. I was a candidate for uh, director of two uh, state highway patrols, Florida and Alabama. Mm -hmm. And I had, went, I had gone through the preliminary interviews, and both jobs looked pretty good. Uh, but a very good friend of mine, with whom I had worked in Italy as a colonel in military government, became dean up at Rutgers University in Newark. And he said, look, why don't you come and teach up here? And I said, well, teach what? He said, oh, you know enough about a lot of things. And he uh, got me an assistant professorship, and I taught public administration, constitutional law, and the criminal justice system. 
Wow. And then from there, didn't you found a school of Kalu? No, that came quite a bit afterwards. Okay. I, from there, I went to the University of Southern California and became assistant director of the Delinquency Control Institute and mm -hmm. coordinator of the, their police science program, which at that time was the largest in the United States. We had over 600 uh, undergraduate and graduate police science students, mostly from the Los Angeles Police Department mm -hmm. and the Pasadena Police Department, Long Beach Police mm -hmm. Department, Santa Monica Police Department, and others in Los Angeles County. Uh, uh, I stayed there for a year and a half mm -hmm. and uh, went from there to New York University Graduate School of Public Administration where I worked with Paul Chapman, for example, and Fred Thrasher mm -hmm. uh, in a, a very advanced uh, uh, type of uh, uh, police science education and was made chairman of the, what they called their Law Enforcement Institute at the time which conducted a large number of seminars, uh, usually five days or uh, ten days, uh, in arson and rep uh, sex crimes and various other things, and which we drew on an average of about 100 to 300 people for each one, a very, very effective type thing. It was at that time that we founded the Institute of Criminology. That's what I had reference to. Mm -hmm. And then you worked there for a number of years? Yes, uh, we, that lasted for, from oh, about 1951 to 1963. That must have been one of the first in the country. It was, uh, uh, and uh, of course it was largely dependent upon the GI Bill of Rights. Mostly what we got were people coming out of the military, mm -hmm. many of them from the military police, and going into uh, the Postal Inspector Service, going into, or trying to get into the various other federal agencies, mm -hmm. uh, many of them going into private investigation or in private security, and a large number of them going up for promotion in the New York City Police Department. Mm -hmm. Sort of the forerunner of John Jay College of Criminal Justice in some In one ways. way, yes. It wasn't as, as broadly based, though. There was very little about corrections, mm -hmm. and the heavy emphasis was mm -hmm. on criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. And were you in on the founding of John Jay College? Yes, sir, but in fact, I was, I was teaching in the city university system at the time because in 1963, I became the senior instructor at the Center for Correctional Education uh, up at Rikers Island uh, of the New York City Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. but which was, for educational purposes, a part of Burr Manhattan Community College. And oh. uh, uh, that program uh, was uh, incorporated into uh, the College of Police Science, which later became John Jay uh, College, and I came with it in 1965. So you were there at the very beginning of faculty? Well, uh, I was uh, the second wave of faculty, ah. let's say. The first mm -hmm. wave of faculty uh, apparently came from uh, uh, all from the New York Police Department. Uh, Mike Murphy picked them out, lieutenants and captains, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they, they came in the mm -hmm. spring of 1965, and I came in the fall of 1965. I want to backtrack a little bit because I know that once you got to John Jay, you already had a very strong reputation. Wasn't it the case that you had already founded the American Society? Well, of I was one of the founders. Uh, what happened was when I was teaching at the University of Southern California, I got an invitation from Orlando W. Wilson, who was the dean or the chairman, I guess, at that time, before he became dean of the program up at the University of California in Berkeley. And he invited me and quite a few other people from the Los Angeles area to come up to Berkeley, where with August Palmer and Douglas Kelly and uh, a number of other people in the field, they discussed uh, changing the uh, Association of Police Science Instructors into a broader criminological criminal justice society. Mm -hmm. And we had three days of discussions, and finally, at the end of the three days, I was elected secretary treasurer of the new society, which had no money, so the treasurership was easy, and editor of the newsletter, uh, which uh, was the precursor, of course, of criminology and interdisciplinary journal. Which is one of the finest crimin uh, criminal justice criminology journals. Well, thank we you have for saying so, because I was the editor for three years. Yes, yes. So you were you were in on the very beginning of two major major uh, institutions which have had an impact on criminology in this country. I think that uh, uh, both those institutions, but a number of others uh, that don't always receive as much credit as they should also had a lot to do with the building up in those early post-war years. Why don't you mention Michigan it? State University particularly, Indiana University, Penn State University, mm -hmm. and uh, the various state colleges at uh, uh, California. Uh, they hired so many ex-military police officers, people that I had worked with for years. Uh, Fresno State, for example, under uh, De William Dean Stein and Fred Boulson, uh, San Jose State under mm -hmm. Willard Schmidt, and various others. Uh, if, even uh, uh, going farther north up to Washington State, uh, where under uh, 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 V.A. Leonard, they built up a very big program. 
Th These are all in the late 40s. This is, n this is in the late 40s. If you think back to your own education, I know you got a master's or two masters along the way. Yes. Who were some of the teachers that were important to you? Well, at Columbia, as I told you, I had no criminologists, so when I was doing my graduate work there, they brought Jeremiah Patrick Shalhou up from the University of Pennsylvania. He had written that uh, mm -hmm. famous book, Private Police, about the uh, industrial police in the Pennsylvania coal mines. Oh, he was a great yeah. student of the Money Maguires and things of oh. that sort. And he worked with Marvin Wolfgang and with Thorsten Selene uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And he came up uh, once a week and gave two seminars. Uh, then, as I said, uh, Michael Lonergan, who was the uh, professor of clinical psychopathology. Mm -hmm. And um, I did my major work, however, in public law under Walter Gellhorn and uh, Henry Steele Commager, people of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found uh, them uh, much more intriguing, shall I say, and much more helpful in my later work. And your later work spans just about every aspect of criminal justice and criminology, well, doesn't I, it? Well, that's one of the things I felt uh, uh, is important because too many of the people in both criminology and criminal justice too narrowly define themselves either as uh, in juvenile justice or in corrections or in police science or in theory or in quantitative measures or instead uh, it seems to me that uh, people should have a much broader area of interest and a much more varied experience and background tell, tell us a little bit about how you can absorb so much and be so far-flung as a scholar I, you seem to read voraciously you seem to absorb everything you read uh, you don't require much sleep. Tell us a little bit about all that. Well, it's genetic. My father had a photographic memory. Uh, he could uh, read a book and virtually uh, recite the whole book uh, uh, almost verbatim. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young, I had a hobby of reciting poetry. Uh, in Ireland, we have uh, the c custom of children have to have a party piece. That is, we didn't have television, we didn't have radios. So when you had guests, each of the kids had to stand up and deliver either a song or a dance mm -hmm. or a recitation or something. And I learned hundreds of poems, uh, mm -hmm. uh, long ones, I, half of everything that Kipling wrote, etc. And uh, I can still <laughs> recite most of them today. And it's the same with my reading. I read very fast, I, although I never took a fast reading course, mm -hmm. and I remember uh, much or most mm -hmm. of what I read. Does, do you attribute your, your own special skills and talents to uh, the reason that you're invited to lecture all over the world and you're so well known or, and you lecture on so many diverse topics well they're all within this general construct of criminology and oh, criminal great. justice and I try not to uh, uh, narrow myself by uh, uh, every time I come to one of these meetings I try to uh, introduce a different topic entirely like at this meeting I'm talking about crime and criminal justice in Singapore and uh, it'd be easy to uh, j just get on to victimology or just get on to corrections or just get on to alternatives to incarcerate, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And you can build a, a reputation that mm -hmm. way, but I'd much rather, I suppose, be a dilettante uh, going across the, uh, the whole field. I don't think you're considered a dilettante by anyone. For the record, we should say that this meeting that you just referred to is the 1996 Academy of Criminal Justice Science meetings in Las Vegas, Nevada. And it's a very p interesting part of the history, too. You know, the, American, uh, the Academy of Criminal Justice Science used to be a part of the American Society of Criminology. And uh, uh, they broke off because they felt that too many sociologists and uh, people of that uh, ilk uh, were getting uh, to run the uh, American mm -hmm. Society of Criminology, and uh, they were not uh, applied or practitioner-oriented enough. At first, I was against the idea. In fact, I chaired a committee that was uh, set up to see if we couldn't uh, bring them back into mm -hmm. the fold. But now I think it's a good idea. The competition between the two has in, uh, improved both organizations. Both of them have gotten much larger. Most of them have much better programs every year. Uh, most of them are engaged in uh, uh, giving awards to people who uh, need them and deserve mm -hmm. them. And uh, I, I, I don't think now that it was a bad thing that uh, the, we have the two organizations. Mm -hmm. Mentioning awards, you're pretty modest, but what, what is the award you're most proud of? It's hard to know. Uh, uh, I think there's one thing I've noticed, that since I retired, I get more awards than I ever got <laughs> while I was working. I guess they don't feel I'm a competitor anymore. Uh, but uh, I think I got the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Society of Public Administration, which I thought was uh, uh, oh, very good since so I had left public administration mm -hmm. uh, academically many, many years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, the Bruce Smith Award from the Academy of Criminal Justice Science, mainly because Bruce Smith and I were very close together. I worked with him for years, both on surveys, and uh, I, I actually he was my mentor at Columbia. 
And uh, I, I gotten several awards from ASC, the Herbert Block Award, the President's Award, etc. And I appreciate all of them. There's another organization that you were very active in, whether you received an award or not, I don't know, but it had to do with the abolishment of capital punishment. Do you oh, want to I was talk uh, about the that? president of the American League to abolish capital punishment for 11 years, and then I was chairman of the board for about 10 years more uh, during the big fight, which we uh, virtually won, and then, of course, uh, uh, the Supreme Court reversed our victory, and we're back into the uh, capital punishment mm -hmm. business. Terrible thing uh, when you look at it. As of December 31st, 1995, there were nearly 3,000 uh, American men and women on death rows in the United States. Uh, we're kind of hypocritical, you know. We criticize other nations for uh, doing certain things. In fact, one of the things I'm pointing out in my Singapore paper is uh, the criticism in this country about the use of the death penalty in Singapore. Uh, we outperform South Africa, Russia, and every place else in the world with sentences of death. We don't always carry them out. That's true. When, when was the society successful, in your view, in terms of uh, gaining its position so that the, the country agreed with uh, the well, society? Well, in 1964-65, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court uh, said that uh, uh, capital punishment, as it was presently mm -hmm. uh, carried out in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, was cruel and unusual because mm -hmm. it had no standards uh, or vague standards. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just seemed to get out willy-nilly with sometimes mm -hmm. the least uh, uh, the least uh, really dangerous uh, getting capital punishment and multiple murderers and professional hitmen uh, not getting it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, since then, uh, decision after decision has uh, uh, almost encouraged the states to go back to capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And now certain legislation, which has been considered, is going to cut down even on the number of appeals mm -hmm. uh, of persons who are uh, under sentence of death, mm -hmm. even though we know that there have been too many cases in the past of uh, uh, death sentences mm -hmm. being imposed on people who turned out later to be innocent. Not too many of them have been executed because of our appeals process mm -hmm. and public pressure, but the fact is that if it hadn't been for the appeals process or the pardoning power, uh, uh, quite a number of persons who had not uh, been mm -hmm. guilty of the crime would have been executed. Mm -hmm. You're a wonderful role model for students because you're an academician and you're scholarly and erudite, but you're also an activist. How, how, what has your relationship been with students over the years? Well, I, I like students. Uh, I suppose every, most professors are kind of exhibitionists, uh, <laughs> and I like them especially when they listen to you and when they respond to you. I found the students at John Jay uh, very, very uh, good for me because so many of them were practitioners and we related very well. Of course, over the years, uh, a lesser and lesser number, especially at the undergraduate level, uh, came from the practitioner group. Uh, but I still, I retired in 1985, so there's 10, 11 years gone. I don't know what's happening now. Uh, but all the years I was there for 20, what, 21 years, I, I found the students to be especially good. Of course, I was active in um, the student organizations. I, I'm kind of a professional Irishman, and I was the moderator mm -hmm. of the Irish Society. And I used to work, do a lot of work with the Free Law Society and with, and with several of the other societies that were within the areas I had interest in. Mm -hmm. You said you retired, but nobody really believes that. Technically, you retired in 1985. Tell us what you've been doing since. Well, I've had a lot of visiting professorships. Uh, the uh, year at the University of Melbourne in Australia, two visiting professorships at Bar Ilan University in Israel, two at the Institute of Public Administration in Dublin, uh, one at the University of Tennessee, one at the University of Texas, one at the University of New Mexico, uh, one each at California State University in Long Beach and California State University in San Jose. Uh, so I, I get around. It sounds like it. You certainly do. You've seen the world. Uh, I wanted to ask you also if you're not doing some things beyond teaching since you've retired. I have an idea that I'm doing quite a bit active. of work as a consultant, uh, mainly to law <coughs> firms. Uh, right now I'm uh, employed by, I suppose, uh, three law firms that are uh, bringing things together uh, to uh, sue five, six universities in the United States in cases involving either sexual assaults or physical assaults on students and I'm their ex expert on campus security, and I've been doing a survey over the last, uh, let's see, since uh, November, mm -hmm. of campus security measures and what policies and measures have followed a particular crime or incident on campuses. Is that a new area for you, campus security? No, I, I, in fact, I had <coughs> previously done a major survey at the University of Kentucky and its branches mm -hmm. and at several other uh, uh, universities, uh, but these were individual and these were for the university. Now I'm on the, in the position of being against the universities. We'll see what happens. Well, that's not, that's typical of your career, isn't it? It takes both sides of many issues as well, things it, change. There, there tends to be a 
not a rule or a practice, but uh, it just seems to happen that you're an expert on one side or the other, and having been an expert for uh, the plaintiff's side, you never get the defense, uh, or if you're a defense uh, expert, you never get the plaintiffs. I have been on both sides. And you enjoy it, I think. I, I enjoy it. It's, uh, it's, it it's, uh, Cross-examination can be very rigorous and sometimes even traumatic, uh, but you're prepared for that, or if you're not prepared for it, you certainly shouldn't get on the stand mm -hmm. because some of these cross-examiners can crucify you. Uh, you saw some of that in the O.J. case mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of other cases, and uh, I've seen so many expert witnesses who proved not to be expert, and I felt uh, that the mm -hmm. cross-examiners did a good job of exposing their lack of expertise. Mm -hmm. You said you enjoyed it, and I'm sure you do. I think you like a good fight, a good verbal fight. But yeah, but judges don't let you fight back. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that uh -huh. to be true. They, they, they give a lot of leeway to the cross-examiner, uh, and uh, uh, they limit you to your mm -hmm. responses. Well, tell us what you've enjoyed or what's been most satisfying for you, the teaching, the scholarly writing, the organizations that you've created or led. What, what's been the best? Well, I, I'm a classroom teacher. I, I like the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not only seminars, I like the introductory courses, and I think most universities make a bad mistake in turning uh, uh, introductory courses over to graduate assistants or uh, to young and uh, inexperienced assistant professors. It's there you get your majors from, and if you teach a good course in introduction to criminology or introduction to criminal justice, that's where you get people who decide, oh, hey, this is a good career, I'm going to go for that, and, and they're with you for the four years. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, a, a poor instructor, and we have too many of them, unfortunately, can turn off even the most ambitious uh, uh, career-driven man. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really been one of your joys. Yeah, those are two of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I, I, my other favorite, of course, is theoretical criminology and uh, uh, comparative criminology. I, uh, part of my work traveling around the world is uh, that I'm very interested in comparative criminal justice systems, not just comparative police systems. And I think we've, uh, this society has done an awful lot to build that area up. The Academy of Criminal Justice that's right. Sciences. Do you now teach in Ireland at periodically? Or I teach in Ireland quite or? frequently. I'm a, a visiting professor. Uh, uh, unpaid most of the time, paid when I'm there at the Institute of Public Administration, which is a semi-governmental uh, setup. And mostly I uh, have students who are from the Garda Shikana, that is the Irish National Police, from the Irish Army, uh, uh, very, very few from foreign countries that come on various kinds of scholarships. Mm -hmm. That's in Dublin, isn't in it? In Dublin, yes. Right. What is your? Th uh, what about the police, a little bit about the Irish police, uh, in terms of, you know, the conflict with the military and whether they are, are service-oriented, knowing that there's the military side there? Well, you know, the difficulty in Ireland because of the situation, uh, which has been highly publicized, uh, and that is that the police, a large number of them, are engaged in what might be called a quasi-military operation on border control. Uh, the reason for assigning the police instead of the army to the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic is that under the Irish Constitution, uh, those six counties up in the Northeast that are called Northern Ireland are part of the Republic. And uh, uh, to put an army there would be an indication that they weren't. All people in Northern Ireland are citizens of the Republic. They can come down at any time. There's no uh, uh, and people from the Republic can go north at any time. They can run for office. Uh, in fact, a citizen of Northern Ireland was one of the candidates in the last campaign for president of the Republic. Mm -hmm. He came in last, but uh, uh, he was uh, able to run. Another citizen of the North, a uh, long time is one of the MEPs from mm -hmm. the western part of, of, of the Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, a big crossover there, and the border police are just uh, to intercept uh, uh, troublemakers, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, to, to use a, a term. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part of it is that, of course, the Irish police are not a military-type organization. They succeeded a military type, the Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, which was a gendarmerie-type uh, organization, heavily armed, heavily mobile. They're an unarmed police, a kind of a civic service-oriented police. Ireland is mostly rural, despite, uh, des despite the, uh, uh, the fact that one-third of the population lives in Dublin, and uh, uh, most of the police there would spend their entire career in small villages and towns, and only uh, maybe after many promotions would they uh, come into headquarters mm -hmm. at Dublin. I guess that leads to the next question, which is, you, you know Ireland so well, you were born there, although you've lived most of your life in this country. How has your Irish background affected your, your view of criminology and criminal justice? Well, there seems to be an affinity between the Irish and police work. Uh, uh, as you look through the uh, various uh, histories of police here in the United States, look at the personnel at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, 
in my own family, a large number of uh, uh, my uh, nearest and dearest have been police officers. An uncle of mine was chief superintendent of police in the unfederated Malay states. Another one was a superintendent of police in South Africa. Uh, uh, several of them uh, have held high rank in the New York City Police Department. And uh, my nephew, of course, uh, has become chief of police of Kansas City, chief of police of San Jose, and now he's the, the police research fellow at Stanford University. So that uh, I was born into a family that had a certain amount of bias towards law enforcement, I would take it, and uh, that, of course, led to some interest in criminology. Not very many police, policemen are interested in criminology uh, as we define it as an academic yes. discipline. Yeah, this is they should have much more introduction true. to it. Right. But some of the best become one of do both at, mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, tell me a little bit about what, what's left undone. It's, it's hard to imagine there's anything that you still Oh, well, there's a lot do. that's left undone. I've been pointing this out to some of the uh, people at the book exhibits here. Uh, for example, there's a mountain of literature on crooked cops. Uh, co police corruption is almost like uh, juvenile delinquency, a word association. What I have done a lot of work, and I find there are a large number of crooked judges, but there is no book, no article on corrupt judges. There's no article or book really on corrupt prosecutors, no article or book on corrupt parole board members. Yet they get indicted, they get impeached, they get incarcerated, but nobody's done any work there. Everybody who looks into corruption, they, they get the low level corruption, uh, $10 to fix a traffic ticket, $50 not to make a gambling arrest or something of that sort. Whereas the big areas of corruption, of course, are uh, outside the police. Uh, uh, police are at the retail level and the wholesale corruption is elsewhere. In fact, in other areas of uh, government, uh, there's more corruption in zoning and uh, planning boards than there was ever in a police department involving much larger amounts of money. And then if you go into corruption in private industry and business and banking circles, as we've been seeing in certain uh, recent cases, uh, they're dealing in millions, multi-millions, whereas in police work, uh, hundred dollar bills are still the uh, medium of exchange. Is there something analogous with the difficulty of getting access to, in white collar crime, related to the difficulty of getting access to judges who are corrupt, possibly? Well, I, th I think that's true. Obviously, these are much better educated people. They're more politically alive and sophisticated. They know about the various methods of investigation. And then besides that, they're powerful. Uh, in addition, even when they get indicted, uh, uh, they present a better picture uh, uh, before a jury or before a, a, a judge, and they get off uh, very, very easily uh, from uh, cases that ordinarily uh, should bring large sentences. Do you have any plans to do some work in this area? Well, no, I'm not, not uh, in terms of publication, but I've been, I've been talking to these uh, acquisition editors and telling them that uh, uh, they ought to balance the equities somewhat mm -hmm. and uh, so that when people talk about corruption, they don't automatically just don't talk about police corruption. All these books on ethics, uh, criminal justice ethics, they all have a chapter on corruption, and it's almost entirely on police. That's a very good point. We just had another book come out on, on police corruption and police ethics at John Jay, John Kleinigrove. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, you're not going to do more in that area right now except to lead the way, sort of point the way to the acquisitions people. What else are you going to, what do you got planned cooking for the next year or two? Well, I, I, most of my activities these days are in Irish affairs. I'm, uh, I am work very hard here in the United States to uh, correct misconceptions about the troubles in Ireland. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't find that at 80 I have uh, uh, all the energies that I had when I was 30 or 40 or even 50. You're not 80. I am. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I'm going to ask you a very difficult question. I don't think I'd want someone to ask me. How would you change things if you had to do it all over again? Well, I'm awfully uh, aware of the fact that change is necessary, and I've always thought if I were a benevolent dictator, I could change uh, mm -hmm. a lot of things. Actually, my ambitions, uh, uh, if you talk to me, say, in the 1930s, was to become a general. I, mm -hmm. I might have been the Colin Powell of, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, Professor McNamara. In fact, as I read his autobiography, which, by the way, is one of the best written autobiographies of a general I've ever read, and many things that he did during his career were things I did. He also was a guy who always had his hand up whenever a school was available. He went to more military schools than almost anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, if I had stayed as long as he, I probably would have uh, compared with him there. I was awfully sorry that he withdrew from the race for the presidency. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make a political comment, but he certainly head and shoulders about mm -hmm. the candidates that we have to look at.
So one lesson from both your life and his is the rewards of education. Of really it is indeed. Uh, my mother was a great uh, uh, believer in education. My father died when I was only six, and all four, all four of us got college educations, uh, mainly because she pushed and pushed. She says, the only thing that stood by you, and it has. And all of the next generation of uh, the family are all college graduates. Most of them, unfortunately, are teachers, except my son is a veterinarian. Uh -huh. He's not in criminal justice, is he? No, no. no. unless some horses commit a crime. Right. Although there's an awful lot of crime around the racetracks, he tells me. Oh, well, there's another area for research for you. No, no. I think there's enough to be done. <laughs> I guess for future generations, there's time still to say, or something, perhaps there's something I haven't asked, something else you'd like to talk about in your life that future generations should be aware of. Well, I think that there's several things that they should be aware of. Uh, for example, minorities have done very well in uh, the criminal justice system, uh, mainly because so many of the entrance jobs are civil service, uh, because uh, discrimination has been uh, virtually eliminated. In fact, some people would even say it's been over-eliminated with uh, 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 extra uh, accelerated promotion to members of minorities. Uh, uh, but uh, those who want to get away from uh, any difficulties in employment and have decent careers and, and also careers where they can serve their own people uh, very well, I would recommend mm -hmm. police and corrections and probation and parole, uh, law school and mm -hmm. uh, work in prosecution or the Bureau of Investigation or eventually, as so many of them have now, become judges. Uh, so that's one th area that uh, I think uh, has been neglected. Uh, the l minority communities tend to be virtually anti criminal justice system, and sometimes with good reason. But the way to change that is not to stay outside and snipe at it. it the way to change it might be to get into it and uh, uh, assist in reforming it. Uh, and the fact that it can be reformed, we've seen at John Jay, uh, uh, certainly with people like Lloyd Seeley coming there, uh, and uh, uh, with Lee Brown and with various others. Uh, 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 I, I, I don't un I quite understand why this animosity has uh, uh, persisted when there's no reason for it any longer. That would be one area I think. That uh, minorities should are welcome. Our students should, uh, if they're minorities, should consider a career mm -hmm. in criminal justice. I found that even our even our students, many of the mm -hmm. minority students, were very uh, antagonistic towards the criminal justice system. In fact, they 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 they'll tell you their career aspiration is a law law mm -hmm. career, not a criminal justice career. All right. So, Anything else? That well, yes, there's always? certainly a large area that uh, has only been touched on, and that is the area of corrections, uh, with m much of the mm -hmm. uh, attempts to reform merely being to eliminate some all right, bad but trivial practices rather than to get at the real uh, problems of corrections. That is that we've got almost a million people in correctional institutions and correction programs mm -hmm. at the present time, but we're really doing nothing uh, to uh, affect change in uh, their attitudes, uh, change in their lifestyles. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I uh, address employer groups quite frequently uh, for various reasons, and one of the things that comes up often is that very few people get fired in the United States because of lack of the appropriate skills or competence for a job. What they get fired for is their bad attitudes towards, uh, towards work. You know, if you look at the Minnesota multiphasic and you see some of those things, mm -hmm. uh, I like work, it satisfies me, I can sit and watch it forever, or don't work yourself out of a job, or why should I work hard to make a profit for the boss, that kind of thing. Uh, that's what defeats people in careers in business, industry, banks, uh, uh, mm -hmm. or wherever. And uh, we don't do anything about that in our uh, training in our penal institutions. Uh, we give them training in even computers and things of that sort. Uh, with, with the attitudes most of them have, that's not going to do either them or an employer any good. And I've, I've made this point to ma uh, many, many times in connection with the federal uh, employment opportunity mm -hmm. programs. Uh, they, they teach basic skills and sometimes some not so basic skills, mm -hmm. but it costs about 350 to 500,000 for every job they get, and the jobs very seldom last more than six months. Not because of the skill, but because uh, these people don't come into work or when they are at work, uh, uh, they don't obey the rules or the regulations. Uh, uh, they just are irresponsible and their attitudes are bad. The old work ethic. Mm. Right. Well, I hate to be a Calvinist, but there was something to be said for the <laughs> work ethic. I have a feeling you're going to make contributions for many, many years to come, in spite of the fact that you say you're now 80 years old. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, endorse the many years to and come, but I don't know about the contributions. And you're certainly not going to be without opinions about everything going on in the criminal justice well, world, I, as you I, I should be. I always was opinionated. 
well. You've, you've been a wonder, wonderful, wonderful person with, and a, his, a really historical figure in American criminal justice. And I, well, it's nice of you to say so. I'll have to get that in writing. I'm, I've been honored to interview you. Well, it's very pleasant to be with you, Barbara. I, I remember very uh, well that uh, I used to have uh, some very nice visits to you when you were out at Penn State. And uh, that I thought that police executive development program, that was a fantastically good idea. And uh, 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 I'm sure that a lot of the graduates there, like a lot of the graduates of the Police Institute in Louisville and at John Jay, have gone on to be high-ranking administrators and maybe putting into mm -hmm. practice some of the things we said in the classroom there. We like to hope so. I do. Because it was a four-week program, which in the 70s was unprecedented, really. To Actually, the students okay. that I'm I, uh, most, well, I won't say crazy about, but I feel most satisfaction about from Jean Jay are those who have gone on to become professors, and quite a number of them are here, and others uh, I meet at uh, ASC, and I meet around as I go around the country. It's really refreshing to have somebody, sometimes it wasn't even the brightest student in my class, he's, I'm an associate professor, 